to welcome you again uh, to one of our Institute Encounters in which we have a talk with uh, distinguished guests who are visiting and speaking under the auspices of the Institute for the Study of Western Civilization. Uh, today our very distinguished guest is uh, Dr. Robert Lawson. Dr. Robert Lawson is the Jerome M. Fullerwinder Endowed cent Centennial Professor uh, of Freedom, is it Economic Freedom? Economic Freedom. Of Economic Freedom. Uh, at the School of Business and Southern Methodist University. Um, Dr. Lawson uh, has to his credit uh, any number of achievements. Um, he is a student of economic freedom. Uh, he's also the head of the O'Neill Center on Global Markets uh, and Freedom. Uh, and uh, he is the co-author each year of the report on world economic freedom, close enough, close enough, close enough, uh, which has become the standard measure uh, used by economists around the world in comparing the amount of market freedom that exists in various countries and also in making comparisons over time about trends in market freedom uh, internationally and in specific countries. So welcome very much, Dr. Lawson. Uh, and I, I wonder um, whether you could tell us how this very interesting intellectual tool, the uh, World Index, came into being. Well, it started with Milton Friedman, of all people. Uh, they were meeting in 1984. Now, I, this is a story that I'm, I've been told. I was a high school student in 1984. But in 1984, if you remember, everybody was talking about the book, 1984. Orwell's novel. And the topic of the day at this conference that Milton Friedman was at was whether or not Orwell was right. And they were arguing. Some people were saying, no, it's not like Orwell said. We don't have Big Brother. We don't, you know, democracy's on the march. Things are, things are pretty good. Um, but Milton Friedman and some of the more economic libertarian oriented people in the audience, well, that's all true in, in terms of political freedom. But when it comes to economic freedom, socialism or higher taxes and more central planning, that mentality is actually marching on. Now it should be said in the 1980s we're sort of at the height of what is sometimes called neoliberalism with Reagan and Thatcher, uh, the Soviet Union seemingly in retreat. So it, it, it no, would have been an interesting time to raise the question. It's the very beginning of, of what some <laughs> right. people call neo neoliberalism. I mean we had just deregulated airlines and trucking, but you know, it wasn't too much before that we had the hyperinflations, not only in the United States but all over the world, uh, wage and price controls, and nationalizations and things like that. So. It was right at the end, right at the beginning of the period where, where people were trying to change their views. So the the story is that they finished that conversation and then they said, well, you know what, the real problem is we don't have a measure. We're, we're trying to f argue or trying to decide whether we're getting freer or not. We don't have a measure of freedom. So that's what led Milton and some other people to start a meeting. They had a few meetings. I got involved as a graduate student. About a decade went by. In 1996, we published the first Economic Freedom of the World Index, which was a our sort of very first index, we've been doing it every year since. So, I mean, it sounds like a fairly daunting challenge to find measures that would be good across cultures where data is available to be able to assess the, the level of economic freedom. How did you go about uh, constructing uh, that kind of uh, index? Well, we made a very important early decision to be data-driven. Um, you know, Jim Gortney is my uh, mentor on this project, the lead author. He was a he went to school at a one room schoolhouse in Kansas. Mm -hmm. I'm a I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio. I, I to be honest, and I'm, I'm a product of the public schools. I can barely find most of these countries on a map. So we decided that if we were going to have any hope of doing an economic freedom index for a lot of countries, we had to just use data that was out there on the well, shelf. Was there available. another possibility? Well, one option is to do a survey, uh -huh. or you know, an executive panel. Jim and I could sit in our offices, read a lot, and just sort of well, I think the Philippines mm -hmm. is a four this year. Mm -hmm. You know, Congo is a two, and 
whatever. But we, we decided that we didn't have the knowledge, the base of knowledge, to do that. So we decided we were going to rely on data from the World Bank, IMF, uh, other different organizations, the World Economic Forum, which is a private group, provides us with a lot of data today. So we put all this data, we crunch it all into the computer, but it's a data-driven index. Um, that turns out to be a feature and a, and, a, and a bug. It's a feature because we have certain authority here. We're using IMF data. We're using World Bank data. The, the bug part of it is that there are some countries that we can't rate. We can't rate North Korea and Cuba. We all know that they have bleak economic freedom, mm -hmm. but there's no data for North Korea and Cuba, so those, are, those kind of countries are not in the index. There aren't many countries in that category, are there? No, we have 157 countries now. Yeah. Right? There's something like 200. We have, if you look at the map, uh, we have covered almost everybody. What, what, did, you, what did you start with? The very first edition of the report, I think, had 117 mm -hmm. or something along those mm -hmm. lines. Um, and we've been adding a few a year as time goes on. Failed states, Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, Somalia, you know, those are also, for obvious reasons, not included right now. So what sort of um, factors do you look at in determining how free a country is? Well, there's 43 variables, and we have 157 countries, and we have data back to 1970, so it's an mm -hmm. incredible, mm -hmm. incredibly large mm -hmm. database. Um, we use everything from tax policy, you know, uh, it's an economic freedom index, so we're trying to measure how close you are to the sort of classical liberal view of what government should do. So low taxes is better than high taxes, mm -hmm. so we have a lot of measures of fiscal taxation, spending. We have some property rights ratings, um, some of those are survey-based, like I mentioned from the World Economic Forum. Some measures of money and prices. Uh, the World Bank has a really cool data what set. What are you looking for in money and uh, prices? Pretty much stability. Uh -huh. uh, stability. You know, governments are in control of the money supply and ultimately as a consequence of the inflation rate. Mm -hmm. And when you have unstable prices and unstable inflation, it's, it's like a tax on your bank accounts in a lot of ways. So um, the World Bank has a project called the Doing Business Project, and they measure how long it takes to start a business, how many regulatory hurdles mm -hmm. there are. Mm -hmm. They also measure how long it takes to settle a contract dispute, things so, like that. So is that a surrogate for regulation, or is it something in its own it's, right? It's not a sur It is regulation. They mm -hmm. actually are directly trying to measure the number of regulatory hurdles that you as a small business person would is it, is it is that the so only measure you use for regulation, or do you have no, a No, we have a whole bunch of others. we got everything from minimum wage regulations to interest rate controls. Um, there are some surveys also on sort of general like bureaucratic. So minimum wage, I'm just sort of trying to get a sense of the challenges in putting yeah. a composite index like this together. Uh, minimum wage regulations might be one of the difficulties that an entrepreneur starting a business would face. He can't afford to pay the minimum wage. Um, but that's also included in the kind of degree of difficulty in starting a business. So what kind of problem does something like that present? Surprisingly, it's very hard uh, to get a good measure of minimum wage. It's only in the few, last few years we've had one. Um, you know, one of the real challenges is you want to have apples to apples. But countries, especially in the regulatory world, they don't have apples to apples. Your minimum wage in Algeria may be completely different. They cover only 40% of the labor force. Mm -hmm. They may exempt teenagers and right. all these kinds of things. Whereas the United States, we have a pretty comprehensive minimum wage. It pretty much applies to the entire labor force. There are even in the United States, though, some mm -hmm. some exceptions for training, sub-minimum mm -hmm. wages for training. Mm -hmm. So you have the exception mm -hmm. for uh, tipped employees like waiters mm -hmm. and so on. So getting a really good, clean apples to apples to apples for 157 countries is a real challenge. Uh, thankfully, the World Bank has taken the time to try to create a, a, a sort of you know accounting system for minimum wages, and we use the numbers that they provide. Um, but it's, it, you know, a lot of things you think you should be able to get. Very simple things about government policy around the world. It turns out you either can't get them, or if you can get them, they're so differently measured from country to country that they're really not very helpful. Now, as time has gone on, uh, you know, have you found ways in which to deal with some of these problems so that the uh, process of uh, calculating what the overall index is becomes more and more refined? We have, and it is, it is a problem, because if you go back to 1970, for mm -hmm. example, we had only 58 countries, but we only had 17 variables. Now I have 43 variables. So it's a little bit like the price index in the United States, where if you, if you compare the 1970 number with the 19, 2015 number, there, there's a different set of variables in the 2007, in, in the, you know, in the basket 70, of, different uh, basket of variables, mm -hmm. like a different basket of goods in the price index. 
Now, what we've done is exactly what they do with the with the price index. So they, we've created a chain. It's called a chain linked economic freedom index. Mm -hmm. And what we do is just like what they do when the basket of goods is changing in the price indexes, when our, or in our case, when the variables that are in, embedded in the index evolve as we add new variables to, to the index. This chain link, it's a mathematical process, but it's a chain linking process to, to link up those, those, those changes so that you get a real like smooth time series. It's very important for scholars who use the index to do long-term studies of economic growth. Whatever. So there's a way of calculating how the new variables related to the old variables. That's exactly right. Yeah. Uh -huh. So we look at the we look at the new variables that come in, and then pretty much what you do is you only look at changes in the variables. Mm -hmm. So if I have a variable last year and a variable this year, I only look at the change in that variable, and then that change gets in, inputted into the index. And so the the new numbers that come in don't affect the level. It's only the, the sort of rate of changes that affect the level. So, it's a little bit of math, but it turns out it's a... It's, it's so I, I guess you're sort of standing on the shoulders of econometric giants of the past who have right. worked these problems out in other contexts and allow you to do the same. Or, yeah. or are these no. uh, your inventions? No, we, we didn't invent this idea. We had huh. to, I had to figure out how to program it, to be uh -huh. sure. But um, yeah, we pretty much are relying on, on the people who did the national accounts back in the 1920s and had to figure the, this problem it out. Goes, how do you compare the back price level? That far, huh? That's when they started doing this. Yeah. You know, but how do you compare the price level in the United States from 50 years was ago? Was that largely done in the United today? States, so, these uh, early, um, early calculations? Uh, yeah, most, yeah. Of that, most of that was settled in the 20s. I mean, the idea is how to do it was settled in the 20s. The accounting standards. Well, who did it back then? Oh, the people like Kuznets were involved. Uh, uh, these were kind of academic, uh, academic economists. economists huh? yeah. Hmm. So, uh, how many people does it take to put together the index each year? Is it just well, you and your colleague? Pretty much. We're a pretty small operation. And his name is? Uh, Jim Gortney is the lead author. Mm -hmm. Jim um, is the senior author. Uh, mm -hmm. my, my mentor is when I was a student. Uh, he's actually blind. Uh -huh. um, so, most of the data grubbing work falls to myself. We have a uh -huh. new co-author named Josh Hall. I've got an assistant at SMU that helps with putting the numbers together. That's pretty much it. It's a very small operation. So there are a lot of people around the world who are dependent on uh, you tireless souls kind of working in the bowels of statistics. <laughs> yeah, actually, we, we, and more, as, the po as the projects become more popular, we, the phone starts to ring around you know, August. What are the new numbers coming out? How are we doing? Well, well do you sometimes, get complaints that yeah, you have dealt with, dealt with particular countries uh, incorrectly? Um, yeah, I've gotten a call from the French ambassador to the United States. And what did he have to he, say? If you've been he didn't. There. He didn't like the fact that France has been going down a lot in the index. I think they're ranked about 65th out of 157 now, and they've been going down. And you weren't uh, offered dinners at five-star restaurants. No, unfortunately, no, no, <laughs> unfortunately, no. The Hong Kong government um, um, uh, has uh, offered to take me to dinner. <laughs> they're number one. So. Um, but you know, mostly you'll get complaints. Uh, that, you know, we're, they just don't, they want to argue about economic freedom. It's not so much an argument about the you know, numbers themselves. Uh -huh. I mean, they, they, they would contend that there are dimensions of economic freedom that you're not counting. Well, they would say things like, well, the minimum wage is a good thing. I said, well, mm -hmm. maybe a good thing, oh. <laughs> or it may not be a good thing, but it's not, a, it's not consistent with the idea of economic freedom. Mm -hmm. um, they may say government spending is a good thing, and, and government spending can be a good thing, but it's also not consistent with the idea of economic freedom. Uh -huh. so. So it's not it's not taking uh, the the elegance of your calculations to task. It's simply arguing that uh, you're not getting a fair shake on other counts that's like right. social justice. Yeah, they might say normatively other things matter, and that's uh -huh. that's entirely possible. We're not really speaking to the, to, to the to these other questions. Well, how widely is the index used? Well, we do very well with academics. I mean, I think the I'm an academic. Uh, my thing I do in my day job when I'm not doing the index is write journal articles and book chapters and so on. And we have literally hundreds and hundreds, actually Google Scholar says I've got 6,000 citations to this index now. And it's a very gratifying thing when other scholars, peers of mine, sometimes peers that are way up the food chain, people at Harvard or MIT, mm -hmm. when they use the numbers in their studies of, of various uh, phenomena around the world. Um, you know, we also get some media attention, mm -hmm. um, quite a lot actually around the world. Um, again, I'm less interested personally in the media uh, aspect of it, but you know, you'll get headlines. You know, media is very interested in the rating. You know, we went up, you know, we were 14th last year, now we're you know, ninth or whatever. When does the index appear? So, it comes out in September. So you, there's a burst of news coverage when it comes yeah, out? Yeah, yeah. Get a lot of, uh, you know, we'll get several hundred media. Around the world. Around the world, yeah. all over the world. 
Is it is it is there more interest in countries that are moving up and want to you know make sure that the, the world knows uh, their achievement and rising up on your index? Or there is, is a bit. You, should, you uh -huh. tend to see that. Yeah, the countries that are liberalizing the most when in the '90s, for example, and 2000s, uh, as Asian countries were liberalizing, and globalizing, and opening their markets to mm -hmm. to the rest of the world, you get a lot of headlines from the Philippines and Thailand. Uh, you get a lot of we get a lot of attention in Eastern Europe as the transition you know, continues from the old Soviet days. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Well, um, I you know there are other indices out there. I don't know if there are competing uh, indices with respect to economic freedom. Are there? There is one index published by the Heritage Foundation, which is a competing economic and, freedom and, index. And, and yeah. how is theirs different from yours? Um, theirs is, I mean, it's data driven in the sense that they look at a lot of data, but it's more of that panel of experts uh -huh. type of approach where the experts at the Heritage uh, Foundation sit in their office. They read a lot of reports. They look at a lot of data, but um, the final numbers are more of an evaluation process. So they, they use a zero to hundred scale. So you know the country will get a seventy four, uh -huh. and next year it'll get a seventy eight, which is a little bit better. But it's not. A, it's the difference between it is that ours is in, is really just a formula. It's, a, it's an algorithm. Um, you There's know, no there's, seat of your pants it, uh, intuition. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, which means that in my case, if someone questions it, you know, why did why did Albania go up? Mm -hmm. I just say, well, it's because this number changed. Uh -huh. And whereas if they get the same question, it's because they judged Albania to change. And uh, like I said at the very beginning, I'm not very comfortable with with sort of rating countries myself. I don't know that much about these how back, countries. How far so back does their index extend? They started in '95 or '6, and they've been doing an annual since. But they they weren't able to go because they weren't data mm -hmm. so data driven. They weren't able to go back in time uh, like we did. Now they do rate North Korea and South Korea or and, and me, Cuba uh, because. You know, they, they're, if you were subjectively rating North Korea, it's not, no one's going right. to complain if you just put them at the bottom. Well, how do the two indices compare? They, they, they correlate quite highly. I mean, uh -huh. you know, they're looking at the same phenomena we're looking at. They're just a little bit less formal about it than we are. Hong Kong is number one in both indexes. You know, Venezuela is near the bottom in both indexes. Um, you know. Any conspicuous differences? Um, over, at certain points in time, there have been that one index will have a country look way higher or lower than the other. But over time, they tend to converge. Mm -hmm. So those errors that... Because they're looking at your index. Well, I don't know. I really don't <laughs> think it's possible that's the case. Uh, but um, there have been a few uh, cases. But at the moment, though, I don't know of any, anything that's really grossly different. So it's probably good that there's competition yeah. between indices. That's always helpful, isn't there? Yeah, and there's also a little bit of specialization. We're this sort of stodgy academic product. Uh -huh. And they're a little bit more of the flashy media product. They've got a much fancier website than we have, things like that. They have more com Do you have any commentary when you publish your index? Why you think a country has gone up or down? Um, or you just put out the numbers? We pretty much just put out the numbers. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. The they only country do commentary? I, the only, they do a little bit more than mm -hmm. we do. The only country that I feel comfortable commentating on a lot is my own. Because mm -hmm. I, I have, I think I have some knowledge about uh -huh. the United States, the policy directions of the United States. But outside of that, I'm very reluctant to sort of make Editorial comments. Are you ever surprised about the United States, just from your impressions on the one hand versus where the numbers go on the other? Well, earlier on, I was I was surprised that the United States scored as well as it did. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are a lot of things even in, even in the '90s when I was when we started the project, there are a lot of things about American policy that I think are at odds with economic freedom. And but the United States was scoring very well, third, second in the world, um, and it dawned on me it's like, wait. All the policies we have that I think are inconsistent with economic freedom, everywhere else has them too, and they're usually worse there. So the United States actually, I, I came to a sort of grudging respect for the American uh, free market, put quotes around free market, but the American market system. Um, so there, I mean, there are two aspects to your measure. On the one hand, where a country finishes relative to other countries, and then what the countries number is. That's right. uh, That's so right. all the numbers could be going up or down, Indeed. but one country nonetheless could be changing in where it stands. That's right. And I usually tell people to use the actual numbers, not just the rankings, because mm -hmm. the rankings are so relative and mm -hmm. it's easy to be... Is there anything else easy. about the indices so, that's, that's relative, or are they all oh, no. absolute within their... The country? index are all, abs are all absolute, and when, when the number goes up, we use a 10-point scale. If it was a 6 last year and a 6.5 this year, mm -hmm. that's an improvement. 
and it's, and it's the same magnitude at all time, all points in time in our index. So if you look at the index as a whole, uh, and you look at it, you've been able to kind of retroject it back to 1970. Um, if you look at the entire series, uh, I guess that's what, uh, almost 45, 40, 45 years at this point. Um, what are the trend lines? Well, starting, starting about 1980, which is in our political context, the Reagan Revolution in the United States, Thatcher elected in, at the same time in, in, in the United Kingdom. This is when monetary policy stabilized, taxes fell, privatization started to take, take on as opposed to nationalization. So in the 80s, you saw the world average increase dramatically. Um, I mean, on our scale, about a point and a half, which is a big change on a 10-point scale. For the U.S. For the whole world. For the whole world. world average increase. Uh -huh. It wasn't just the United States and, 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 and Thatcher's England. It was all over Each the world. Each country would count equally in changing the world yeah, average? You can, you can do it by population weight or, I or not. So but either way, either that way. is true. Uh -huh. yeah. mm -hmm. And this is, you know, this is the era of, what you, some people call it neoliberalism. You know, you, sometimes you hear it called the Washington Consensus. This is the era of, of, the, of the free trade. We're going to lower uh -huh. tariffs. We're going to stabilize our monetary systems. We're going to lower marginal tax rates. We're going to privatize uh, more, more industries. That wave that began in the 80s continued on into the 90s. You see the world average increase. About the year 2000, by the end of the 90s, it's starting to level off. But in the 2000s, in the last, say, 10 or 15 years, the world average is kind of just hovered at a, at a pretty much, at a higher level than it was, but a pretty much a, a flat line. I see. And the trends that you can discern generally are across the board trends. Uh, most countries, when you had the period of increasing liberalization in the classic sense of markets, most countries were moving in that direction together. There wasn't a bifurcation or anything like that. Absolutely. There's only a handful of countries that were going down. That were Almost everybody was going up. Some of them were only going up a little bit, but, but you know, and some were going up a lot. But uh, only a handful of countries, Zimbabwe, Venezuela, they are right. going down. In the last half of this period, the United States is actually on that list. The United States is going has gone down, down quite a lot. Beginning long. about when? 2000. Beginning about yeah. 2000. Our high water mark was 2000. Uh -huh. um, is that a, a change that was the result of a changed administration? Well, it is the period, it, is, it, it, it does time when George W. Bush became mm -hmm. president in 9 11. And I, I think that some of the reactions to 9 11. Uh, including the, the, the increased spending for war uh, and, and things of that sort. So that's raising taxes, raising yeah. size of government. Right. I think that's a little bit of it. Uh -huh. uh, interestingly, though, for the United States, most of the declines for the United States are in the area that we're, we're measuring property rights and rule of law. Mm -hmm. And um, we have three. We have nine variables from three different sources, and they're all going down. And that's a very concerning thing. So that kind of raises a question in my mind about the construction of the index. So say you have a situation in which property rights are in fact improving. Uh, the law is increasingly protecting property. Say you had uh, the Kilo case decided uh, otherwise the other than, way, yeah. than, it, than it was. Um, so that's improving uh, in terms of freedom, but at the same time for other reasons, maybe defense reasons, uh, the size of government spending goes up. How do you determine in constructing the index which of those two things gets to be weighed more heavily, which right. is more important? Well, in our case, we've experimented with many different weighting schemes. In our case, we have five broad areas. So spending is an area, property rights is an area, money is an area, and these five areas end up just getting average. I see. Um, we've experimented so with different weighting systems. So you're kind of making systems. that decision that yeah. Since you really can't say you're going to, they're right. all important. You'll right. consider them all. Yeah. And one of the things we do, which I think is very important to do, is we provide our data to the world. And there mm -hmm. have been people who have objected to a variable or an area. They're, they're free and to they're do the free. analysis themselves. They, they come can, up with something they can else. Reweight it however they Has, believe. Have, have any economists done interesting things uh, with it? There have been a couple of economists that have published papers where they said, "Well, you don't think this uh, this weighting method makes sense." And, and has that way. impressed you so as to make you consider whether you should uh, adopt their weighting? Uh, not really. Um, one of the unless you do something really kind of extreme with the weights, uh, it, doesn't it doesn't really doesn't matter because there's so much. much. Most of the times, people that most countries that are good in one area are also good in the next area. So whether uh -huh. you rate one or more, uh -huh. it turns out not to matter a lot. If you do something really odd, something really kind of extreme, then you, you can really matter. You can really affect the ratings, but, uh, but generally not. So it's it's flattened out since yeah. the beginning of this yeah. century. Yeah. More or less. World average. 
world average. Um, and if you've gone down, some if, going up. If, if, uh, I see. So th there's more of a. So you begin to see a kind of bimodality here in the curve. Well, um, the countries that were liberalizing very rapidly in the '90s slowed their rate of liberalization uh -huh. down, uh, and then some countries like the United States started to go absolutely down. And some, and have, some so have any done better? I mean, are there are some strivers upward during well, sure, sure. Like, like, where would you find that in um, the last 15 years? Some of the biggest increases, of course, are coming in the Eastern European era because they're coming out of, of Soviet communism mm -hmm. in 90, 91, and they liberalized. And they have liberalized. they sustained and, that? Or several they, of them have. Okay. Uh, Estonia first was the biggest sort of success story. They're in the top 10 mm -hmm. in our index. Uh, the tiny, we call it the Republic of Georgia. Georgia is uh, ranked 13th now, mm -hmm. uh, and it was a Soviet Republic until 91. So those are the like the biggest movers. We were talking on a 10 point scale countries that it, I didn't have a number for them when they were in Soviet times, but it would have been a two, right? You know, and now it's a seven. I mean, it's a huge, I mean, huge increase in, in freedom. We do track China's liberalization yeah. uh, nicely. They're still pretty low, but they're obviously higher. Uh, same thing with India. India's liberalization, we track that. How does China and nicely. India compare? Uh, they're actually, they're very, very different. Uh, numerically on our scale, they're, they're almost the same. Uh, they're right next to each other. But about they're different. They're but for different uh, reasons. Yes, different reasons. Yeah. So where is China strong in terms of liberalization? Right. Where is it weak? And what about India? China, well, China is is strong on things like free trade, um, you know, open open trade kind of environment. What um, about the manipulation of their currency? Uh, Does that count in the calculation? Not so much. Um, How come? We're, unless it results in a, in a hyperinflation or a variable inflation, it would would be a factor. Okay. So, um, Donald Trump will object. Yes, yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, so they, they do, and they do. Uh, they do poorly in sort of size of government because the Chinese government is very large relative to the economy. India will do better there because their government initially isn't fiscally too big, but Indian regulations are nightmares. I see. So you know, it's sort of a different mix. You get, you end up with averaging to pretty much the same number. What about the? I mean, is there a way in the case of China, or Russia for that matter, where you have? Uh, this sense of, of, of deep cronyism, um, does that get factored into your... Uh, in a couple ways, yeah. We've got a couple measures, uh, both in the property rights and the regulatory area, where we're picking up a little bit of that. Um, we don't measure corruption per se, and the reason we don't is because we wanted to ask, one of the research questions is, are countries that are more economically free more corrupt or less corrupt? And we didn't want to put corruption in the index that would sort of bake in the result that we were interested in. Well, so, rule of law must be one of your... We do, have, we do right? have elements of rule of law, like impartiality of the judges. Right, um, so doesn't that catch corruption? What about it, bureaucrats? It probably does. Impartiality of we bureaucrats? Do have, we also have that. Yeah. yeah. So How do you know that? I mean, what are the... It's primarily from the World Economic Forum survey. The World Economic Forum... So which this is a survey. They ask people doing yeah. business in those They ways. ask business people. Foreigners yeah. and, and indigenous business people. Both. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. WEF is a big, big organization in Switzerland. Uh -huh. They they have this massive survey that they conduct. What countries do best in terms of um, the honesty and uh, fair dealing of uh, bureaucrats? Well, not surprisingly, Northern Europe looks really good on those margins. I mean, comes you across. Know, those countries with such high social is, trust. Is Britain still good on that? Yeah, Britain doesn't do too badly. We don't. We actually until <laughs> until 2000. The United States was scoring pretty Really? Good. So in 2000, we started uh, retreating on yeah, that. That's right. Um, and, and, and what specifically do you think was causing that? Well, you mentioned Kilo. I think Kilo was a, a, a notable sort of object lesson for a lot of Americans. Say, wait, see, you know, property rights aren't quite as secure when they can take property from A and give it to B. Uh, that was a, a thing. I also, you know, I think the response to the financial crisis in 2007 and 8 also had a lot to do with these numbers going down. So what, what you're measuring is perception. It is. I mean, in the case of Kilo, you don't have a measure for how much yeah. property was taken right. for private purpose. Regrettably, we don't have that, yeah. You just have the anxiety. Exactly. Um, now, of course, anxiety means something because it factors into how people behave, but it's not quite the same thing as the it, phenomenon it's itself. Right. It's <laughs> not. I would love to have what you, you suggest. I would love to know how many acres of land, would, you know, whatever. But, you know. And I, but again, I need it for 157 countries, even if I could get it for the U.S. Do you have any way of, of, of capturing bribery? There are a number of measures of bribery. We have one variable, which is about what the World Economic Forum calls irregular payments, which is kind of <laughs> code for bribery. So they, they actually have, they ask business people, um, have you had in the last year to give irregular payments? 
and then they ask it for specific areas, like for importing or exporting, irregular payments to, um, you know, for hiring and firing or something like that. Um, and so they actually break it down. But we use that; it's one of our variables. So how how do, I mean, again, I guess Northern Europe yep. does the best. Yep. The United States do pretty well on that. We do okay, but it's gone down. It's gone down. Yeah. So people are, in this case, They're people are reporting their experiences. Yeah. Yeah, that's, it's not just an impression. That's probably it's, that's it's what's happened to them. Exactly. I mean, that's the claim. Uh huh. And in China, is that a high figure? It's not as high as you think, but no. it's, it's middle of the pack. Russia, it's terrible. <laughs> the the former so communist countries of Eastern Europe still still pretty bad. Still I mean, pretty they're, they're really struggling, and those habits have been very hard. What to about break. Georgia? It's, it's, they've gotten much better, but it's still low. Um, what, what have they done um, to clean up their act? Well, one of the things Georgia did is they fired, in, in 2006, they fired all their police officers in the whole country. Because the police officers were the most corrupt aspect of their society, they fired them all. They fired them all. A and, whole and, lot and, of them. And how, how long a transition well, was the, it? Well, the joke was that? that they got rid of their police and crime went down. <laughs> and it's true, because the, the main criminals that people faced were actually police officers. So now I, they slowly rehired and restaffed and retrained. And, uh -huh. and now it's uh, really it's quite clean. No kidding. Uh, the, in Eastern Europe, at least in Georgia, where I have some experience, they say it's just the most amazing thing. You can actually call the company that provides, say, cable or satellite television to your to your flat. Mm -hmm. You can call, and they will show up, and they will install it, and then they just charge you whatever the fee is. And there's no extra payment. There's no bribe. And it happens this century. <laughs> and it's, you know, in the old days, in order to make it happen in any kind of timely way, you had to bribe someone to, to get... Now, in, in Eastern Europe, I would think that more than anything else, this is a function of competition. That companies want to be honest because they gain your business. Whereas, whereas, yes, right. as, as things have moved into the more competitive environment, that, that's naturally the what flows. Whereas, whereas if you don't have a competitive environment, not only is there not much of an incentive for the bureaucracy to do that, but the only private enterprise you have are individuals taking money for themselves. So they'll do that if they don't think they're, well, yeah. they'll do that whether they think they're being paid well or not, I suppose. But, uh, yeah. Um, so the United States has, has not been faring all that well of late. And uh, it began in 2000. Uh, has it kind of moved steadily downward since? It's been pretty steady. And, and one of the things you, is you could not tell in looking at the data when Bush left and Obama came in. The trend is pretty much straight linear down. Mm -hmm. um, and that's actually something you see in the index a lot, is that it doesn't track political change very, very closely. You'll see countries liberalize. With left, with nominally left-wing uh -huh. uh, political parties in charge, you'll see countries where their indexes go down, where they, they get worse. They they start taxing more, controlling more, and they're doing it with what is nominally a, a you know sort of business-friendly government in charge. So you know Nicaragua is currently run by still run by the Sandinistas. Daniel Ortega is still the president, and he wears he's a communist with you know a capital C. He wears uh -huh. fatigues and uh -huh. red armbands, and yet Nicaragua is liberalizing like crazy. Um, in the United States, we had George W. Bush, you know, free market Texan, and that's when the index fell. Well, I assume the Reagan so, must have produced some effect, didn't he? Yeah, the Reagan, Reagan went up. And Thatcher produced and Thatcher, an effect. Under Thatcher, Thatcher, yes. Yeah. So you, but you'll see, if you look across the whole world, it's a very weak kind uh -huh. of correspondence between the political rhetoric that's coming from the government and what's actually happening to the and, index. And, and party control, too. Yeah. It doesn't seem to sure. be what you think. Yeah. So uh, what are driving the changes? Well, I think uh, in all of these cases, it, 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 a lot of it has to do with sort of people's sentiment. People's sentiment. I mean, I think Reagan was the result of people's dissatisfaction with the '70s. I mean, the wage and price controls and the inflationary environment in the '70s. Uh, but and they're enacted through a political so change. Reagan, Somebody had to change laws yeah, sure, and policies. Absolutely, absolutely. So Reagan was the conduit. So how does it act with Daniel Ortega? Well, interesting. I think the well, you know, for one thing, the the Santa Nisas, to the extent they were successful, were successful because of Soviet, and, and then Cuban, and then Venezuelan money, but Soviet money is gone, Cuban money is gone, Venezuelan money is definitely gone. Right now, the only thing that he can do to stay in power is to, he'll give, you know, he'll talk socialist rhetoric in Managua, but then he'll go to New York and try to raise capital for more sweatshops to open, because that's the last thing, that's the last place for them to get resources. Um, I think that, you know, so, so their rhetoric is still socialist, but their actions are more, more free market than than they, than they would ever admit to their own people. Well, you might think if, if, if I mean, it sounds like you're suggesting 
that what drives these things, particularly the free market changes, is rationality. They realize their country is going to do better. But if that were true, uh, everything would continually go up, uh, and it doesn't. So why does it sometimes go up, and why does it sometimes go down, and why does it sometimes just level off? Sure. What's what's personally rational isn't always what's uh-huh. rational for the for the whole group, for, you for know, government, so, governing governing you know, leaders especially. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So I mean, you know, when things are going very well, it's it's very easy to to say, well, how about we, you know, give some subsidies to those guys over there, and you know, these are our friends, we should help them out, and all those are our friends too, we should help them out. We don't like those guys, so we need to tax them. Uh-huh. That kind of cronyism is easy, will bubble up very easily. It's in the interest of the political leaders, it's obviously in the interest of some groups in the society. It's against the interest of the whole group, right? So you get these sort of cycles, you know, where yeah. that kind of stuff goes on for a while, but as it goes on, you know, the, the overall society starts to perform less less efficiently. And every now and then you get sort of a break point where there are people like, hey, wait, this is not working, we gotta kind of go back. Um, it's not a deterministic cycle, it's not like a Marxian dialectic or, you know, we're just, you know, but it, you do see this happen. In country after country after country, these sort of liberalizations, and then everybody gets kind of fat and lazy, and well, let's well, let's relax. Look, I know this is not what we're supposed to do, but you know, these people really need our help, and so we help that industry out. And you do that a few more times, and the next thing you know, you're you're in a crisis. So there are periods of production when people are kind of trying to get ahead and yeah. working hard, and then periods of consumption, which are not just individual periods of consumption. Yeah. But the government decides to consume Afraid so, yeah. for, the, for the sake of um, entrenching itself. It's, gonna, it's now going to reap the benefits right. of, of what it did before. Um, but you think even now we're on a higher plateau than we were back in the 70s in the we, early We 80s. absolutely are, and, and I, I think we kind of forget this. You know, there's mm-hmm. a pessimism, mm-hmm. pessimist in all of us. We see the current problems we have, but we forget, you know, in the early 1970s, in the United States, you know, nominally, you know, market country, you know, there was serious consideration about national economic planning in the United States. We were looking at Japan, oh, we need nationalized economic planning, we need to, we need central planning, economics textbooks that taught our students, okay, Texas Tech students had economics textbooks here in the 80s that spoke favorably about central planning. Mm-hmm. That's all gone now. I mean, you have all these people who think socialism. Well, is yeah, okay, yeah, maybe, and maybe it'll, nothing goes away forever. <laughs> but I mean, you just don't have a lot of, of intellectuals. You've seen the, the attacks from mainstream Democratic economists against Bernie Sanders. Mainstream economists today don't go around saying, "Oh, we need central planning." They did 30 years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, again, no one goes around saying we need to nationalize done oil and industry. Done and gone. Uh, uh, there's elements of Keynesianism, particularly mm-hmm. uh, you know fiscal. Fiscal Keynesianism, uh-huh. but not in the sort of picker, picking winners and losers sense uh-huh. of central planning. That that's a dead ideology, at least among sort of elite economics. Uh, well, there is certainly thinkers. among people who want to be green, a notion of picking yeah. winners and losers yeah. with the kind of global right. climate impact right. Right. in mind and other things of that sort. Yeah, I mean, obviously these these the, the elements are still there. They're still they're, there. Just, they're just vastly weaker than they were, you know, a generation or two generations ago. So you're you're optimistic. In the grand scheme, yes. In the grand scheme. So, if I wanted to play the role of pessimist, I would say, for the sake of the conversation, you know, A, in the United States we've seen a big shift in the Democratic Party, certainly in the last 10, 15 years, seeming to be uh, ever more entrenched in this campaign, uh, over to the left. And I mentioned before all the folks who think we have a, a socialist candidate who's given the front runner a run uh, for her money and, and moved her further to the left. In, in Britain, uh, we have the Labour Party sort of seemingly behaving very much like the Democratic Party, right. uh, taking somebody who would have been considered quite outré uh, t- during Tony Blair's sure. heyday, right. say, and, and he's taken over the party. Uh, you certainly have a kind of dirigiste Europe, don't you? I mean, under, under the European yeah. Union, uh, central planning or at least general central manipulation uh, from Brussels. Um, most of history is, uh, you know, the story of government living off people, sure. <laughs> basically. Uh, couldn't you argue that, um, uh, you know, we've, we, the, the freedom is, 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 is kind of anomalous, and now we're going through what could be a kind of regression to the mean. We're going back yeah. to where humanity has normally yeah. been. Well, but you, you could, again, there is literally no country 
uh, outside of Venezuela right now with hyperinflation in the world. Um, you remember Italy, uh, Greece? Right. They have fiscal crisis, but they don't have inflation. Well, they have the euro. So, that's right. so, so they're, 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 they're basically they're, German they're currency. Has, there has nice not been that. widespread nationalization <laughs> yes. uh, uh -huh. in, in decades. And, uh -huh. um, the idea of sort of wage and price controls at the at the at the country level. You can have de facto natural nationalization through regulation. You, you, can't you, do. You, you can, and there's certainly all kinds of shenanigans and things I'm yeah. not happy with with policy. And there are uh, at any point in time there are going to be some currents that are positive and some currents yes. that are negative. Do you much know much about what's happening in Russia? Um, a little bit because of yeah. the index, you know. But, I mean, uh, so. uh, now you get well, you, the, the the general impression most observers have of Russia uh, is a country that's basically living off its mineral resources. Um, it has a freer economy than it had under communism, but it's still choked by political favoritism. Um, are there people, what, what, is, what is the state of the economic profession in, in Russia? You would think that if it was sort of in communion with economists in other parts of the world, it would be pretty dissident there. It would be a, a, a voice of criticism and complaint. To, to the extent you know, right, right. Uh, and maybe you have users of your index over there who are kind of in touch with you. Sure. Is that the case? I, I mean, I know some some liberal, market liberal mm -hmm. economists in in Moscow. Um, and okay, one of, down on the street. One of them now lives in Washington, but, <laughs> oh. because life got too um, really <laughs> hot for him. Uh, like literally, he could have yeah. probably was in some danger. For his criticism of, of Putin and the uh -huh. regime, having said that, um, uh, there's a very prominent on um, Samantha Jankov, who's a Bulgarian, but he's in Moscow, running a market liberal think tank. He's a very prominent uh, economist, uh, worldwide known economist. So, uh, and that, so I mean, they're out there. You know, um, I don't think Russia. You know, the, the problem there is the democracy there doesn't run very deep. So, you know, whether. What people think doesn't matter so much in the authoritarian regime they have. Mm -hmm. You know, economists, uh, which say, you know, elite economic opinion among economists, but even just regular people's opinions and things make carry much more weight in, you know, Western Europe and the United States because we have a, a system built up where those views, they don't always sway, but you know, they, they, they percolate. We have intellectual freedom we've got, in a sense. We've got, we've got political freedom to go with. Yeah, not not so much. I would say the right to vote, but the right to freely discuss. Exactly. Yeah. yeah exactly. And those things do matter. The so climate you, opinion you, matters. You're probably familiar with the Freedom Houses sure. index of, of, of political freedom. I don't know if that's constructed uh, on the basis of, of data in the same sense yours is, or whether it's more an impressionistic. It is know, more impressionistic. More impressionistic. Yeah. So, what are the correlations between their measures of political freedom and your measures of economic freedom? They're positive. Countries that are economically free on our index tend to be pretty politically free. They tend to have democracies and freedom of speech and so on. Uh, it's not a one-to-one -one correspondence by any stretch. Mm -hmm. um, in a statistical sense, the correlation is about a 0.6, which is positive, but you know, well, not one. Pretty strong. Yeah. Strong. Uh, but you know, there there are there are a lot of oddballs out there. Uh -huh. Singapore scores right. uh, second on, on our index. They're very high in economic yeah. freedom, but they're pretty low on yeah. political freedom. I mean, it's not a totalitarian right. state, but it's it's not it's not at the top of Freedom House's ratings. Um, India is a reverse case. Yeah. India gets a very good political rating. It's it's a freewheeling democracy. They have all the democracy they can stand, probably, mm -hmm. but they're pretty low on the economic freedom index. So there are enough oddballs that are high on one and low on the other in one direction or the other that that, that drives that correlation. Do the movements down. as a whole tend to go in the same direction? Um, yeah, I've actually got a little work on that. I think that they 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 can be. One of the things that I'm interested in is is what happens when you try to combine, you know, one type of high freedom in economics, let's say, or and, and or vice versa. Yeah. So, uh, like Venezuela tried to do this. Venezuela tried to in the in the 80s, uh, pr pr prior to Chavez, they tried to create a, a country that was going to be centrally planned, nationalizing oil industries, nationalizing hotels. I mean everything. They wanted to control the economy, but they also wanted to keep the democracy. At the end of the day, we kind of know what's happened with that. That combination doesn't really seem to be sustainable for them. And they've now got a controlled economy and a controlled political environment. Um, the reverse could happen. Israel is another case. Back in the days, Israel uh, was very socialist. I mean, heavily socialist ideology and economics, but then they wanted to have a freewheeling democracy. 
Um, they tried that for a while, and it didn't. It, it what's happened there is that they've liberalized their economy to match the the, uh, the uh, political system. So those trends, though, I think take decades to play out. I mean, you don't get, you know, they're not they're not mechanic mechanistic. You know, if this, then immediately this changes. They're, those relationships are, are very complex. Milton Friedman said complex and not unilateral. Uh, complex and not unilateral. Are, are there? I mean, I'm 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 now reading this book by uh, Easterly on tyranny of experts. Um, and of course he's making a big case more than anything for political freedom, I think in the sense that people have uh, the right to vote, the right to discuss, the you know, sort of the, the right to assembly, you know, those kinds of things. How, how, how many instances do you find, apart from Singapore, uh, of relatively authoritarian countries that nonetheless get freer is 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 a path toward economic freedom right. with any real degree of communist uh, that of kind of a benevolent despot who kind of leads the country. You think of maybe Chile under Pinochet, Pinochet. and uh, Lee Kuan Yew in Singapore. Are there many other examples of that? I think you have exactly the two examples <laughs> that exist, and it's it's actually a big debate in a lot of market liberals is. Because it's very seductive, it's tempting. To, you know, if we just got a dictator, and he was one of our guys, we could just make this happen. We don't have to do this messy business of convincing people and getting elected and all of that. It's very seductive to go that route, and it—that's exactly what happened in Pinochet, uh, in the case of Chile, um, and Li Kuan Yew. Uh, but you know what? For every one of those guys, and, and by the way, Pinochet wasn't a good guy either. But for every one of those guys, there's a dozen Idi Amin's and a dozen, you know, Mugabe's and Chavez's. So uh, Pinochet's and, hands, so, unlike Lee Kuan Yew, were, so were pretty bloody. bloody. Yeah. But what what led him? What was uh, what, what went on there? Was it simply him? Blind luck. I think I mean, was it luck. with the blind luck and having him because he had a free enterprise organization? No, he, he didn't have a free enterprise. So how did, it, how did it come about? Uh, he, he took over because they wanted to get rid of Allende. Right. And uh, uh, then he's like, looks around and he says, okay, now what? And he didn't know what to do. He had no interest in economic policy. He was just a general. Uh, he took over. He was kind of given the job. So somebody says, "Got to call Milton Friedman." Is that was that? The he, he called down to the uh, to, to the local university in Santiago, and it turns the, out, the right guy picked up. It turns <laughs> out exactly there were a bunch of University of Chicago trained economists, and they're like, "Well, uh, we've been talking about doing all these things, and now they got their shot." Um, he hadn't arrested them, fortunately. <laughs> no, that's right. I mean, um, I really do get annoyed, though, with, with market liberals who speak favorably about Pinochet. He was an evil man. He killed thousands of people. Uh, and I don't want to force people to be free. That's, it's an oxymoron, uh, actually. Now, that Lee Kuan Yew was somewhat so, different. Somewhat different, much different, yeah. And he was kind of British educated. Right. And, um, I mean, but he could have gone to the London School of Economics and. Uh, and, and, and been a Harold Lasky socialist, that didn't happen. Again, except for those two examples, most of the countries that have gone uh, to an authoritarian route, they don't choose economic freedom, they choose central planning. So generally the two things go together. They do. So in Eastern Europe, where there was a feeling that it's, it's sort of a, uh, a, a general preference for freedom, and they choose freedom at, at all its levels, and it usually worked pretty well. More or less, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. You know, again, it's not a it's not a guarantee. It's not a one to one kind of thing. But it's definitely uh, they're definitely together. I don't uh, I don't think they're you know linked you know automatically though. So living with this index as you do um, it has made you an optimist. Oddly enough, it has. I mean, it has. Um, for one thing, I think it's added a little bit more evidence and scientific uh, evidence to the debate. There are certain things that you just can't say today and get away with saying. You can't say, for example, that free market capitalism is going to destroy the poor. Because I've got data that says the opposite. You could get away with that argument 30 years ago. There's no data. You could make any argument you wanted. There wasn't any. But again, you're talking about economists. You're not talking about politicians. Well, right? mostly, yeah. Well, Occupy Wall Street Trudeau. is all about how the Trudeau, yeah. capitalism is. Yeah, that's right. And But I still think in the long run, having these data available is going to or percolate down even to the general debate. There are just some things you just can't say. Like the economics textbooks today 
are radically different. I think in large part they're not just our index, but just the idea, just the availability of data, which acts as a real antidote for nonsense uh, when, when you know, people just can't spell so, off. Nowadays, where is the profession in America, would you say? Has it moved to the right over 30 foot? You're suggesting it has. Right meaning liberal, to a liberal, classical liberal poll. It's actually moved to, to the middle in a lot of ways. It I has. Mean, there, there are not a lot of Milton Friedmans now in the profession. Uh -huh. Uh, but at the same time, there aren't a lot of John Kenneth Galbraiths or no. uh, Harold Lasky's. So why aren't there either. more Milton Friedmans? Uh, the, the economics. This is about more about the sociology. I think of the economics profession. It's, yeah. it's moved away from politics. It's moved okay. into the ivory tower. I think this is a negative. You mean thing. it's become highly quantified, highly, highly quantified, and abstract. Yeah. More interested in, in puzzles, economic puzzles, and there aren't as many public except for Paul Krugman, uh, and he frankly takes a lot of criticism for being for being so political. There aren't a lot of, uh, there's not a lot of esteem now in the economics profession for people who are public economists, mm -hmm. like Milton Friedman was. Mm -hmm. um, that's becoming uh, a, a, a badge, oh, you're just a sellout mm -hmm. uh, um, if you're getting involved in politics. Or even, not even just politics, but like the political discussion. I mean, you don't think economists have a responsibility to speak to the public about good economic policy? I actually, I, actually, I think that this is a, a negative development. I think yeah. the profession is turning inward. It's, it's looking more to talk to each other and less to talk to each other, to the outside yeah. world. Yeah. I think this is a bad, bad trend. Okay, well, I don't want to end the interview on a negative yeah. thought. Yeah. So, uh, so, on the whole, looking at the world itself rather than right. at econ economists, sure. you think the world is, is wising up as far as... Uh, good economic policy is concerned. The, the really extremely crazy bad ideas are now, I think, dead. You know, the idea of widespread central planning, widespread nationalization, using hyperinflation, all of that is basically dead. There's all kinds of microeconomic, like green energy subsidies, there's all kinds of individual things that are stupid, but, but the, the game is, is, is completely changed uh, in a positive way. Great. Well, thank you for telling us that. Yeah.